When we look at mankind and human history, I am often amazed by some of the things that I see. Man is called the upward looking one. And that's because something in man is innate that tells him that there is someone or something that is greater than he. So you can go to the farthest reaches of the earth, some of the most remote and desolate places, Wherever you find human beings, you will find them bowing down to something. They will be worshiping something. Whether they're looking up at the sun or the moon or the stars or admiring the speed and abilities and agilities of the animals who fly and swim and run and roar, man will find something to worship. It may be a volcano. It may be a river. But because there is something apparently in our DNA, so to speak, that tells us that we need to bow down to something. Unfortunately, often man will make something by his own hands and then bow down to it as though it made him. And so therefore we see idolatry, polytheism that exists in most civilizations that we study in history. When we look back at them, we can clearly see that they have worshiped and oftentimes they have worshiped something that they have made and they revere as that is an idol. This is the reason why God found it so repugnant and repulsive and insulting when he had done so much for his people, when he had brought them out of bondage, they had walked around in the wilderness for 40 years. They weren't lost. They were disobedient. And because of that, God refused to allow them to go into a land that he had promised. God had sent Moses to release them, to free them, to be their savior in that type of which that Jesus is the antitype. Moses went and destroyed the religious system of the Egyptians. God led them through on dry ground, turned the Red Sea into a highway. And they walked through to across the Red Sea and away from the Pharaoh. But before God sent Moses, he had to identify himself because Moses had spent 40 years in the middle of a culture that was filled with idols that had men's bodies and wolves' heads and and lions' heads and lions' bodies and humans' heads. He had spent that much time in that culture, and I'm sure... It had a tremendous amount of influence upon Moses. God, of course, when he called him, Moses had left uh, flee Egypt because of the crime of killing an Egyptian. And God called him to the mountain. There seeing the burning bush and God commanding him to remove his shoes from his feet because the ground on which he stood was holy ground. Therefore, God identifies, who am I going to tell them? You're sending me back. Who will I tell them that sends me? God said, you tell them I am. I am sends you. I am sends you. And what God wanted Moses to know, that he was I am. He was the self-existing deity, the God, the creator God, the life-giving God. Man often in this day of secular humanism and immoral beliefs and idolatry and love of material things, man often forgets that life demands a life giver, that creation demands a creator, and that design demands a designer. And therefore, God let Moses know on that day, I am, I am all of that. I am the one that, as it is written, that you live, you move, and you have your being. I am the one that formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. I am the one that put man to sleep after revealing to him that he was not to be alone and opened his side, removed a rib from his side, made Eve, placed her at his side, indicating she was not his slave nor his master. I am the beginning of society. I am the one who created the family. I am. And that's what God wanted Moses to know. And in saying this, God gives Moses an understanding 
of his power, of his majesty, of his deity, of his sovereignty, that there is no equal with God, that God has no rival, that God is, I am. Therefore, for man to understand this, Moses really couldn't understand this until God revealed it. Why? Because with our finite abilities, we can't know God. I can't see him. I can't smell him. I can't touch him. I can't taste him. I can't hear him. Therefore, the only reason we know that there is a God and we know his character and we know his attributes is because God has revealed himself to us. Speaking of the glory of God that is revealed when the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and verses 5, Paul said, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power. Paul said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The Apostle Paul is basically saying that which he knew and that which he understand, understood did not come from man. Paul continues speaking of our finite senses and our inabilities to understand God's promises, God's will, and God's way without God's word. Then Paul basically quotes the prophet Isaiah, who pleaded for mercy for God's people who were in sin in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and verses 10. Paul said, but it is written, I have not seen, ear have not heard, neither have entered into the hearts of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But then he goes on in verses 10 and tells how God remedied that situation. But God had revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. We know of God because of God's revelation to us so that we can understand who I am is. In the book of Galatians chapter 1. Verses 11 and verses 12, when Paul spoke to our brethren in the Galatian region, Paul said, but I certify you brethren, or I reveal to you brethren that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, Paul said. He said, for I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it of men, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to allow us to know is that Jesus has re revealed to us, God has revealed to us by his son those things that we need to know. When we go to the text of our subject that we have been assigned, Jesus was attempting to prepare his hand-chosen men, his apostles, his disciples, his friends. He was preparing them for the most traumatic and dangerous and trying and tempting day of their life. The days of his passion, his vicarious suffering, and eventually his crucifixion. When we look at this, the, the, the moments of his mission or the, the reason for his mission was coming to uh, bear. For the scriptures say very clearly in the golden text of the Bible, John chapter 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. According to Jesus' own words, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. So as Jesus is teaching them of the culmination and completion of his ministry, he teaches them first humility. He washes their feet. In John chapter 13, 1 through 20, he teaches them that the servant is not greater than his Lord in verses 16. He foretells and reveals of his betrayal. John chapter 13, 20 and, and 21, or 21 through 30, verily I say unto you, 
one of you will betray me. He gives them a new commandment, a new commandment of behavior, a new attitude, a new standard, a new way to live with one another. If they are going to survive in the trying times that are going to come, a new type of fellowship in John 13, 31 through 38, a new commandment I give you, he says, I give unto you that you love one another. There had, this was not the first time that was commanded, but Jesus gave a new standard. Love one another as I have loved you. In essence, I have loved you when you were wrong. I have loved you when you were undeserving. I have loved you when you were arrogant. I have loved you when you diso were disobedient. You love one another also as I have loved you. Jesus said, by this shall all men know, because nobody else does it. You've heard me say many times that Christianity is not natural. Jesus gave us an unnatural way of acting, an unnatural way of thinking, of presenting ourselves, because he said, you love your enemy. You, you do good to those who despitefully use you, those that betray you, frustrate you, disgust you, and disappoint you. If someone hits you on the right cheek, you turn the left. None of these things that Jesus says is natural. So he says, heaven's too good to miss. Heaven's too good for it to get by you. And if you're going to come to my heaven, then you're going to prepare yourself by doing the things that I command you. A divine injunction. You love one another as I have loved you. In a society that's losing its ability to love, to where hatred and, and division and malice and wrath, when we've got blood running in the streets right now, across the water, across the pond in Europe, because of hatred and wrath and greed. When we see these things, we have to come back to what the Lord tried to tell us. Love one another as I have loved you. Peter is warned of his imminent denial, his disdainful, disloyal denial of the Lord. Then when they are all shocked, disheartened, disillusioned, in disbelief, Jesus then confronts them and comforts them. In the book of John 14, verses 1 through verses 3, after he's told Peter he's going to deny him, after he's talked about their arrogance, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, he says, are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Can you imagine after they were disheartened and looking within themselves and examining themselves when the Lord said, one of you will betray me, and they're saying, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And then he turns right around, which is what Jesus, his very attributes of love, and said, I can fix you. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Then Jesus spoke about his leaving. And Thomas said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto them then, where we study tonight, the words that, re that are in our minds and our hearts, the words that comfort us, the words that strengthen us, the words that give a foundation to our faith, the words that let us know that God is love and he will never forsake us and he will always be there for us. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way. What do you mean we don't know the way? I am in this great I am statement. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man coming to the Father 
except by me. In essence, Jesus says, man has always been in search of his creator, of his life giver. Jesus, in this foundation statement of love, says, I am all of us. Even though the apostles had personally witnessed the Lord's miracles, they were there when Jesus went to a little girl's funeral and brought her out alive again. They were there when Jesus had came to the tomb of Lazarus and called his name, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walked from the tomb and Jesus commanded to loose him and let him go. They were there when Jesus took a little boy's lunch and fed a multitude. When Jesus calmed the winds and the waves. When Jesus showed over and over his power over sickness, raising the dead and healing the lepers. And what Jesus was saying to them is you are not ready. Once he said to them, why? When they were on the boat and they went and woke up Jesus, Jesus was trying to take a little nap. He had been walking for miles. He'd been preaching for days. He had had multitudes pressing up against him. And Jesus was just trying to take a nap, just trying to take a sleep. And when the wind and the wave came, they woke up Jesus. Jesus came and said, peace, be still. And then he turned to them, and can you see the white hot uh, indignation in his eyes when he looked at them and said, why, why are you so fearful? That word fearful in that context comes from a Greek term which means timid. Why are you so timid? Here is what Jesus worried about. And I want you to take this if you don't hear anything else I say tonight. A man will not die. For that which he does not believe. And Jesus is worried about their faith because he knew that they would not die for that which they do not believe. The Hebrew writer later said for all of us to understand faith. Faith is, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The Hebrew writer said without faith. It is impossible, it is impossible to please him. For they that come to the Father must first, first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When we look around this, this country today, we see so much hatred. We're teaching our children to hate the nation. We're teaching them to hate the Constitution. We're teaching them to hate one another. We'll set little children of different colors and races beside each other and teach them to hate each other. Then 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, we're going to tell them to get a gun and put on a uniform and put your life on the line for a constitution that we taught you to hate, for a nation that we have taught you not to believe in, and for a people that we have taught you to have no faith in. A man won't die for that which he does not believe. And we as a nation had better understand uh, that little thing. The Lord understood it. And he knew that if unless he was able to get them to change, to be stronger, to open their eyes and understand he wants to weigh the truth in the life, that they would not be able to endure what God wanted them to endure. So when we look at this, God revealed himself fully in his son, Jesus Christ. In the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verses 15, when Paul spoke to the brethren in Colossae, he spoke of Jesus, who he said is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. In essence, God's nature, God's love, God's attributes, and all of God's power is revealed through Jesus and given to us in the gospel. The word mystery often used in reference to God, his nature, his truth, his plan of salvation, means a truth 
a divine truth which is above man's ability to understand, too profound for us to comprehend without revelation. Therefore, Paul, who was made a minister when he spoke to the polytheistic society there in Colossae, Paul said, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom, Paul said, God would make known what is the riches of his glory, of the mystery among the Gentiles, which Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of and glory in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verses 16 once Jeremiah said in essence as we think about Jesus saying that I am the way Jeremiah said uh, saith the Lord stand in the ways and see Jeremiah said ask for the old path where is the good way and walk therein and you shall find rest to your souls, but they said, we will not do this. We will not walk therein. It's evident that man is lost, even when he stands in the ways. There are so many things that are attracting us, that are tempting us. James said one time, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. He said, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he every man or any man. But every man is tempted, according to James, when he is drawn away, when he stands in the ways, when he's looking at the various ways, when he is drawn to a bad way, an evil way, a wrong way, a perverted way, an immoral way, when he is drawn away by his own lusts. God has done everything he could to save us, to show us the way so that we can be saved. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and verses 4, when the apostle Paul was speaking to our brethren at Corinth, Paul basically says a veiled way, a veiled gospel, a gospel that cannot be understood. Jesus told you and me, we're the most important people on the earth. You're God's people. You believe in his word. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Therefore, the Lord said to you, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in them. In essence, you have to lift up Jesus by the things we stand for. We stand in the way he leads us. By the things we believe, we believe in the way he leads us. By the things we preach, by the way we handle our lives, by the decisions that we make. I tell people all the time, when you're born in this world, you look like your parents. You resemble your mama and your daddy. But when you leave this world, you resemble your choices because your choices will be revealed within your life because our lives are about decisions and the consequences of those decisions. So the apostle Paul said to the brethren in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, but if our gospel be hid, if it's veiled, if it's not fought for, if it's not stood for, if it's not preached with passion, if we don't fight the good fight of faith, if we don't prove all things and hold fast to that which is good, when we capitulate and compromise and run away from the battle, Paul said, if our gospel is hid, it is here to those who are lost. If we want to save our families, if we want to save our nation, if we want to save the lost, if we want to save 
the world. We cannot have a veiled, unpreached, unstood gospel in whom he said the gods of this world has blinded, blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light or the way of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. In essence, the apostle Paul says, we've got to let folks know what the way is and that Jesus is the way. He spoke of the Lord's stated mission at the home of Zacchaeus in the book of John chapter 19 and verses 10. For the Son of Man is come, Jesus said, to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus came to search for the least, the last, the little, and the lost. Jesus leads, we follow. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 21, when Peter was speaking, understanding that martyrdom was most certainly in his life, he said, for hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And notice what he said about Jesus, what he couldn't say about Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, what he couldn't say about David or Solomon, what he couldn't say about Elizabeth or Rebecca or Rachel or any other human being that has lived on the earth. We follow the way of Jesus because he said, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. In essence, Jesus is the way. That's a story that was done in the 1800s. It was called Alice in Wonderland. Many of us have read that story to our children, and I think that my children grew up on it, and then I had to see it again with grandchildren. But the fact of the matter is that Alice is in Wonderland with all of these anthropomorphic creatures who are talking. And I'm not going to talk about the creatures. One in particular is the Cheshire Cat. The Cheshire Cat is in the tree, and in the movie, he is characterized with a great big smile and a grin and sly as he looks at Alice as she looks for her way. She gets to a crossroads. She looks up at the Chancellor Cat and she says, Sir, sir, which way should I take? Sir, sir, which way should I take? The Chancellor Cat began with a big grin. Then the full cat emerged. He says, well, that depends. Where are you trying to go? She says, I don't know where I'm trying to go. Then the Chancellor Cat says, well, it doesn't matter which way you take. Because if you don't know where you're going, any way will get you there. And that's where many of us are in our lives. Many of us have an identity crisis. We don't know who we are. We don't know whose we are. Jesus is trying to get us in his way. He says, come to me. Come to me. All of you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest to your soul. In a society where at 5 or 6 o'clock every day, when you turn on the television, go on the internet, listen to music, you can hear lie after lie, after lie, after lie. We're becoming a society that doesn't know or understand the truth anymore. Jesus says, I am the truth. Too many of us have listened to everything and everybody, to this lost, arrogant, indifferent, skeptical, disillusioned world. Jesus is the truth. While others have lied with their, their selfish concerns and appetites and agendas, Jesus wants all men to be saved. Therefore, he tells us what is right, shows us what is right, and has demonstrated what is right. 
Jesus, the Son of God. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 4, the apostle Paul writing to Timothy, who he had left at Ephesus. He had left Titus at Crete. Paul says, who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Jesus wants everybody to have the truth. Jesus wants nobody to live in lies and surrounded by lies. Why? Because the truth liberates. The truth strengthens. The truth encourages. The truth gives us direction. We cease to be a slave to all the various concerns and appetites that are within this world. Jesus said in the book of John chapter 8, Verses 31 and 32, if, that's an if clause from the great I am, if you continue in my words. I seem to remember one time Jesus saying, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He says, if, if you continue in my words, then, when, then, are you my disciples indeed? When you continue in my word, when you continue in my truth, when you receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word of God, which is able to save your souls. Then he said in verses 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. There are those who are caught in anxieties and fears and frustration and hatred and wrath and disappointment. Right now, the second highest cause of death between those six years old and 15 years old in America is suicide. We are becoming a culture, a society where self-murder seems to be a viable solution for many folks who don't understand the truth, who don't understand the love and kindness and forgiveness of God because they don't know the truth. They're enshackled in fear and the first casualty of war. Colin Powell said it, and before him someone else said it, but the fact is, it is a truth that the first casualty of war is the truth. When we think about what's happening in Europe, they were showing a lady who had walked across the screen during a newscast saying, stop the war. That poor lady was locked up, and they say she may be locked up for 10 years. Why? Because the truth is suppressed. Because the truth is has been knocked down and pressed down because the truth has been removed from the eyes and the ears of those people. Sin cannot fester and take root where the truth is and where the truth liberates. In the book of John chapter 17 and verses 17, in the true Lord's prayer, he said, sanctify them through thy truth because your word is truth. Because man has been given free choice. The tempter has many ways of making us lose sight of what is real, of what is true, of what is honorable, and what is unquestionable. And this is the reason why the psalmist speaks of the house of the wicked being overthrown. And he declares, and Solomon declares in Proverbs chapter 14 and verses 12, that there is a way, a path, which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. God wants us to come into the light. I seem to remember an 80s movie where there was this small lady who was in a movie, I think it was Poltergeist, and the little girl was lost somewhere in the house with the ghost and all of that ridiculous stuff going on, and she was saying, come into the light, come into the light. Well, that's what Jesus says to us every day, come into the light, because the lies bring darkness 
and they cause us to be lost. In the book of 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and verses 7, John said, if we say, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, John said, we lie. He said, that's not true. That's not true. You can't have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. He says, you lie and do not the truth. In verses 7, he said, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sins. I've told you before, and I'm sure every one of our fine ministers in this room have said it at some point in time in their preaching. The Lord didn't say a whole lot about the devil. He didn't spend a lot of his earthly mission and time talking about the devil. He talked about the things that keep us from the devil, but he didn't talk a lot about the devil. All the Lord had to say was the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. And when he said the devil is a liar, that's all the Lord had to say. In the book of John chapter 8, 44 through 45, Jesus speaking and rebuking some hypocritical Jews, Jesus said unto them, you are of your father. Can you see Jesus looking at that bunch of arrogant hypocrites, understanding he's the son of God? They want folks to bow down to them and honor them and call them names of honor in the marketplace. Jesus says unto them, you, you hypocrites are of your father. And he calls their father name the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He said he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him, Jesus said. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar. And the father of it, Jesus, is referring us back to the first and most diabolical lie that has ever been told. That brought death upon all mankind. The devil is the greatest mass murderer of all time because all of us that die that press death's pillow we die because of that lie this is why peter said in first peter 5 and verses 8 peter said be sober be sober be sober be sober be vigilant keep your eyes open you're being stalked there's someone that wants to steal your joy steal your future Destroy your life and take you away from those things that are true. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The truth was delivered in the grace, and in that grace was the teaching that brings us the truth so that we can turn from the propaganda of this world that tells you that there are people that you have to know in this world, that there are things that you have to have in this world, that there are places that you have to go in this world. Don't you understand that a lie is still a lie, even if everybody believes it. And the truth is still the truth, even if nobody believes it. And what God wants us to do is stand on those things that are true. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to Titus, who he had left at Crete, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and verses 12, Paul said, but the grace of God that bring it salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. If we refuse the truth, as the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them because of blindness 
of their heart. The truth will blind your heart. And then Paul said, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. And this is what the apostle Paul is saying. When you turn down the truth, there are all types of problems that you bring in your life. I believe he told the brethren at Thessalonica that he, because they refused to accept the truth, that God would send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. God sent Jesus that we might have life again. When the devil brought his old ugly, mean, no-count self into the garden and brought heaven's feud to earth and came to God's innocent children and brought the feud before them with that lie, God said, this is not over. This is not over. But because before Adam ever took of the fruit, before Eve ever took of the fruit, before the foundation of the world, before there was sin, there was already a Savior. God had already decided we're going to die in their place. Jesus says, therefore, I am the life. In the book of Revelations chapter 1 and verses 18, when Jesus had risen from the dead, and as John was writing to the seven churches in Roman Asia manner, he said of Jesus, as Jesus spoke, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. In 1 Corinthians chapter 19, in verses 22, as Paul spoke to the church, Paul shipwrecked, snake bit, beaten down, locked up, one time stoned, and the only reason Paul survived the stoning was he pretended to be dead. You know what Paul said about this life and about what Jesus is saying as he is the life? He said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are above all men most miserable, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that sleep. For since by one man, one man, death came, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I can see Mary and Martha. Can't you see them? They had been sending for Jesus, their hearts broken. All of us have stood at the bedside of someone that we love, watching them sick and watching them slip away. All of us have fallen on our knees from time to time. God, please help us. God, please have mercy. I understand that there are some, even right now in this congregation, who are praying for a loved one. So can't you see Mary and Martha? as they are standing there watching Lazarus. But he's not supposed to die. He only had the flu. It was not, nothing that was supposed to kill him. And don't you know, as they watched their brother slip away and became weaker and weaker, and they were sending for Jesus, and Jesus didn't come. They sent again for Jesus, and Jesus didn't come because this was one of those teachable moments that they had to understand who Jesus was as the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus finally came, having been informed that Lazarus was dead, they ran to Jesus. They ran to Jesus, and they said to Jesus, 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 if you had been here, Jesus, if you had come when we called you, Jesus, if you had been on our timetable, Jesus, if you had come, my brother would not be dead. Our brother wouldn't be dead if you had come when we called you Jesus. And can you see Jesus standing there calm? He's the son of God. He's filled with love. He loved all three of them. He loved everybody that was watching and listening as she created this stir in public, speaking in rebuke to the son of God. Jesus said, your brother shall rise again. 
Can you see him speak matter-of-factly to her because of the situation? Your brother shall rise again. She says, I know it. I know he'll rise again in the final resurrection. I know that when everybody gets up from the grave, I know you're not telling me something I don't know. And they are distraught and filled with sorrow and grief. So we understand those sisters because they had so much confidence in Jesus. We know at the resurrection, Jesus, can you see him as his voice may have changed and filled with love in his eyes? And he looked at them and says, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. Can you imagine as he said that? And then he may have stopped and stared them dead in their eyes. I said, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Because he's doing that today. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the light is saying it to each of us today. Do you believe it? Because if you believe it, then you will be steadfast and unmovable. If you believe it, it doesn't matter what people call you and tell you you're on the wrong side of history. You'll stand. Because if you believe it, it doesn't matter what the world does to you, what they say about you. You will be those who will always be strong. You will not be like the Hebrew brethren that were told that you have need again for milk and not meat. When time when you ought to be masters. You need to start again. The Lord is asking, do you believe it? Have you heard my word? Do you believe that I stood before Pontius Pilate for your behalf? Do you believe that they put me on the scourging post and beat me half to death? Do you believe that I refuse to give up, that I carried that cross up Golgotha's hill, a garbage heap on the outside of town with buzzards and dogs and rotting bodies and stench do you believe that I the son of God who had to tell my own apostles if I wanted to fight I could fight I could call legions of angels and tell Pontius Pilate you don't take my life I give my life Jesus stands here today and said do you believe it do you believe it because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God do you believe it enough to change your life? Jesus gave us the example, gave us the way, so that when this life is over and we leave this veil of tears, James said, what is your life? What is your life? Do you understand that what is your life but a vapor that appeared for a moment and vanishes away? You can't stay. You can't stay. So you have to prepare to leave. And you acknowledge that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that we can only get to heaven by obeying him. You bury your old man in a watery grave. You rise to walk in the newness of life. And you've changed everything about you. One of these days, I want to go to heaven. One of these days, I want to hear the Lord say, well done good faithful servant don't you one of these days i want to meet him in the air don't you one of these days when i put this body off the body which came from the dust returns to the ground the mother earth who gave it and the spirit returns to god and i stand on my record on those things that i have done during the course of my life i want to hear the lord say well done Solomon said this to all of us. Let's hear the conclusion to the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty.